Hey everyone, um, this is going to be the first recorded lecture for you. We are going to be finishing up chapter 10, which is going to be on the trial process. I just want you guys to pay attention through the rest of the semester as I create the modules to put into Canvas for you. I will be posting the PowerPoints for chapters 9, 10, and 11. And I will also be posting YouTube videos that I expect you to watch. The other thing that we will be doing throughout the rest of the semester is having um, live lectures as well on Zoom, which again, I will be posting all the links for you. So anybody that is having issues or not understanding uh, the lesson from these short lectures, then you're invited to please join us on the live lecture and ask all the questions that you need to to make sure everybody is getting the full understanding of the materials. With that, uh, we are going to transfer over and I'm going to continue to speak as I go through the PowerPoint for Chapter 10. Okay, so we are going to continue on with Chapter 10 and we're going to be starting with the criminal trial process. So we already know that the idea of a trial is to figure out if somebody has committed a crime or not. The nature and the purpose of the trial isn't always so cut clear. We wish it was just very easy to figure out if somebody was really guilty or not. But since we do not know that, a lot of times we have to look at whether we have enough facts, which means that person would be factually guilty which depends on the type of evidence we have uh, that we will discuss here shortly. Or is this person legally guilty? And that may be more of understanding what we call circumstantial evidence and showing that this person has some kind of legal obligation. Uh, maybe it's part of a contract and therefore that also may allow the jury to find them guilty of the case. We already know that our system is built on an adversarial system, and which means we have two different sides that argue and try to plead their case to allow for a jury who are supposed to be fair and impartial and we will talk about jury selection here as well. So as you can see, there's a pretty easy process, at least overall it's simplified, in the different stages in a criminal trial. So we've already discussed earlier, before we went online, about all of the pretrial activities. So the next step would be your initial court date, which would be where a lot of the jury selection takes place, at least on the first day. Then we have opening statements. The prosecution goes first, then the defense. Then we have what we call presentation of evidence. The prosecution, again, gets to go first. The prosecution, since they are the ones that have to prove that somebody is guilty, they get the privilege of presenting all their evidence first. The other part to that, too, is that the defense is not allowed to be caught off guard. So therefore, since the prosecution goes first, the defense hears everything that has to be said and then can prepare a proper argument against what is uh, being presented. Then we have what we call closing arguments, which is another simple process. Then the judge will explain everything to the jury and what their duties are. The jury will go back and discuss the case and they will come out with a possible verdict and the person then will either be sentenced or released. So let's continue by looking at each one of these a little bit more in depth. So trial initiation. We've discussed quite a bit in our class already about the speedy trial and what it allows and how it's defined. So as you can see here, it says that most state 
uh, laws have anywhere from 90 to 120 days as a reasonable time. And a lot of times that will depend on what the case is and what type of other things are going on before that. So there's a lot of what we call motions and other court dates that have to be set to know what type of evidence is going to be allowed in the courtroom and the judge making sure that everybody is playing by the right rules and everything is being done fairly. So once the trial has been set and started and we are in the proper amount of time for whatever case it may be, sorry, the next process is then our jury selection. And this gets quite interesting. Uh, the prosecutor and the defense get to challenge who's on a jury. The goal of it is to make it fair and impartial for the defendant. So we have a couple of different ways we can go about this. We have what we call challenges for cause and preemptory challenges. And a preemptory challenge is a chance literally for the prosecution or the defense to say, I just don't want that person on the jury. They don't really have to have a cause. It's kind of an at-will type of thing. But challenges for cause means you have a better reason or you have a reason that maybe that particular juror you feel is going to be biased, prejudiced. Maybe they have some kind of connection to the case and therefore it's either going to help the prosecution or help the defense. And so depending on which side of the court you are on, you're going to try to either keep the people to help you and get rid of the others or vice versa. This whole process is called voir dire. It's the questioning of potential jurors. And I've explained how uh, when I was in the jury box, the judge asked us all questions and I got asked and dismissed off my jury because I knew the officer in charge and therefore it put me in a bad position and it would have put the prosecution in a bad position uh, and the defense would have had a position for appeal. There's always an interesting thought process behind the jury selection. Uh, so the scientific jury selection, uh, it's understanding how to use your preemptory challenges correctly. When should you use them? How should you use them? I'm also going to be posting uh, some information on jury selection for, from the uh, Cornell Law University for you to look at this a little bit further. Uh, on this, also at the bottom of the slide, it says um, there's a thing called sequestered juries. And I've explained that before as literally these juries have to be locked up in hotels. They're not allowed to have any contact with the outside world, including family, due to the fact that we cannot have them influenced by the media, by things that gets leaked out. Um, the, we don't want them influenced by the defense or their family or the prosecution, or the victim's family. So therefore, they're literally locked down, they're guarded, all of their meals are delivered. They cannot even discuss the case amongst themselves until they are actually in the jury room. So these people are separated from society altogether until the case is over. Once that whole process is done and we're ready to start, we have what we call opening statements. Again, the prosecutor gets to go first. And basically, this is a summary and kind of a pre-presentation to the evidence that the prosecution is going to show and the evidence that the defense is going to show. So the prosecutor is going to get up there. They're going to explain why this person is in the courtroom, what they believe this person did, and kind of give the jury an idea of what they're going to hear about in this case. The defense is going to get up and do the same type of presentation, only explain how it was not the defendant and how that presentation, their presentation, will show it may have been somebody else to create the reasonable doubt. I am also going to be posting a 20-minute YouTube video of an actual opening statement from a prosecutor to a jury so that you can see this done live. Once the opening statements are done, we literally have the presentation of evidence, which means 
this is where your witnesses are going to come into play. Any evidence you've gathered is going to come into, into play. And again, you can see all of this done while you watch the Jinx, as well as um, other YouTube videos and things if you watch Court TV. This is how all cases are done. Even if you watch an episode of Law & Order, you will see how this is done. There, there are different types of evidence, though. So we have what we call direct evidence, which is literally hard evidence. It might be the body, as it shows. It might be a videotape. It'll be something that is you cannot argue the fact of it. The other part of the evidence might be... What we, the whole thing that we have to remember is that whoever's presenting the evidence, whether it's from the defendant side or the prosecution side... The idea here is your evidence has to be able to prove, if you're on the prosecution side, beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant actually did the crime. That's what this evidence is for. That's why hard evidence, direct evidence, physical evidence is absolutely necessary for you to win a case. Again, if you pay attention to the Jinx case, they had... All the physical evidence they thought they needed, even though they did not have the head. And so as you watch, you'll understand how not having one piece of physical evidence can make an entire case fall apart. So like I said, we have circumstantial evidence and real evidence, hard evidence, physical evidence. Circumstantial is literally making an inference drawing a conclusion and making it sound like or appear. The media kind of gives us that idea when we hear about a case before we actually hear anything of a trial. You'll hear about a case and you'll start making your inferences from there. They might say, well, it appears that this person was in that area at the time. This person does own a weapon. It doesn't, they're not saying that that is the weapon or that that person did it, but you can start making those conclusions on your own. If you don't have enough physical evidence, but you can build enough ideas and show enough likeliness that that person was there, you can influence the jury to go with the circumstantial evidence versus always having all the physical evidence, at least in most cases. We already know that evidence can uh, be thrown out. So in the evaluation of the evidence, the judge decides what evidence can be presented to the jury. And based on relevance. And what happens here is that we have to be very careful and what is allowed. So the prosecution may want to bring up the past of the defendant. Or the defense might want to bring up the past of the victim. And if it's not directly relevant to this particular case, the judge cannot allow that type of evidence to come in because it can prejudice the jury. It can uh, sway the jury in a way that might not uh, be true to the case at hand. So maybe uh, this person's being accused of robbing a store and they have a history of drug use but have not had any drug use in the last five years and the prosecution says well you know they have criminal behavior in their past you were a drug user you've had um and you needed you know different ways to get your to get monetary items or to steal money to have drugs so if you've done that you know, five years ago, ten years ago, what makes us think you um, did not do that now? You can't always use that type of evidence, especially if it's not current and it's only using it to uh, what we call poison the jury to make them uh, give a, ver a guilty verdict. Just like the defense can't say, well, this person was a prostitute 15 years ago, so therefore... Uh, and our client remembered this person from 15 years ago because he was, he was one of her Johns. And therefore, he decided that 
you know, she must still be in the lifestyle, even though wherever he picked her up from or, or took her from and maybe assaulted her, they would try to use that as a, to shame the victim and say that the victim was deserving of it or maybe presented herself in the same way as she did so many years ago. And a lot of times the judge is going to say that was too long ago. You cannot bring that kind of evidence into the court. The next type of evidence that we have that we have discussed uh, throughout has been the testimony of witnesses. So uh, I have discussed this at length as to whether you're a character witness, an eyewitness, an expert witness, maybe the victim themselves. And so, um, like I said, the idea of having an eyewitness is good, but at the same time, your brain triggers different things uh, in your mind when something happens that's traumatic. Therefore, you may not get the whole story. It may be construed a little bit, not intentionally, it's just how our brains work. So witness testimony can be good. Um, the other thing, too, is having an expert that can come in and do a testimony, but be able to do it in a layman's terms versus scientific terms for a jury to understand. When a person is on the stand, whoever called them up, so if the prosecution calls up a witness and they ask them questions, that's called the direct examination. Then they sit down when they're done asking questions and the defense has their turn and that's called cross-examination. And it goes both ways. When the defense is ready to present their case, they have a chance to do direct examination. And again, prosecution can do cross-examination. If a witness under any point in time who is on the stand giving a testimony intentionally lies, then that is called perjury and that is a charge and that person can end up uh, going to jail for that. Special circumstances that uh, permit people not to be in the courtroom, uh, which we have also discussed in the past, are children as witnesses. You don't always have to have them on the stand. Sometimes they can be, uh, it can be a taped uh, testimony, or it could be done on what we call closed circuit TV, so they're not actually in the courtroom, but we're able to ask them questions without them facing possibly the abusers if it's a child case uh, like that. So one of the things that I've had people ask me about this before uh, is when you get up to testify, if I said, hey, did you guys know that this crime happened and give you details of the crime? And then you go to the police and say, hey, we, hear, we heard about this crime. And the police say, okay. Then they take down your statement. When they go to investigate the crime, they're going to find out that you are what we call a third party. If you are not a direct witness, you cannot testify to something that somebody has told you. However, there are exceptions. So, dying declaration, literally that. If somebody is dying, they're on their deathbed, and they confess to a crime, whether it's murder or something else, that actually has to be given to the court, and it has to be investigated. And if it's found to potentially have been true, then they have to accept that, which means we have people who do get out, who have been wrongly convicted in the past, based on somebody literally giving a confession within their last breath. Spontaneous statements, we already know that that is covered in the Miranda. So if you say anything in the back of the police car or in a jail cell and nobody's questioning you and you confess to crimes, all of that can be used against you. And then if you're in the middle of the trial and there's a break and you go out in the hallway and you start talking about the case or you start talking and you talk about evidence of the case or even make a confession and somebody else overhears you, they can testify to that as well. Finally, the last part of the arguments will be the closing arguments, which means everything's been presented and all this is is a summarization of both the prosecution and the defense's cases. The next step will be the judge explaining to the jury that they must go back or what they call retire and talk about all the evidence and reach a verdict. 
uh, when you select a four person, basically that is the person who's the speaker for the whole group. They're the ones that will make requests. They're the ones that will hand over the verdict to the uh, judge. They're the ones that will hold the votes in the uh, chambers. And they're the ones that basically are in charge of everything that happens with the jury. So the deliberation is literally a discussion on the evidence and how everybody feels about it and what they think about it. And then they put to votes as to whether they believe the person's guilty or not. And I have talked about this before, is to find somebody guilty, you literally have to have absolutely no doubt. So it has to be 110%. It has to be over and above that you believe this person truly is guilty. And if they are, then they can return a guilty verdict. If not, then you have a not guilty verdict. Some of the issues that happen in the jury deliberations and with the verdict is that it can be a few minutes or it might take a very long time. We've discussed how we can go on trials for weeks. And the jurisdictions usually require what we call a unanimous vote, which means all 12 people have to agree. If not, we get something called a hung jury which then uh, can create what we call a mistrial, and the prosecution has the des decision to go back and retry that whole case again. Let me take this moment to kind of give you an example of a case that goes through all of these different steps. There was a deputy that I worked with that was accused of having uh, intimate relations on the job with an inmate. When this person went to court the first time, the victim testified, a few other inmates testified, and the jury actually came back and could not come up with a unanimous verdict. Therefore, we had something called a hung jury. The prosecution felt they had a strong enough case that they actually retried this case a little bit later. Some of the evidence that they had in this case was that this particular officer was sexting with this particular inmate when she was not behind bars. And so therefore she had these messages and was saying that, look, we had a relationship outside when I wasn't incarcerated um, and he wanted to continue that while he, she was behind bars. Now, that's illegal. As an officer, we cannot knowingly hang out with convicted felons. That makes it difficult, especially when you know some of these people personally. Some of them might even be family. So they know we come in contact with people, but for the most part, we're not allowed to make these people our friends. In this case, they had to go back and retry the case. They brought all the evidence in. And before the second case or second trial was uh, started, the potential victim in this case died. She died of a drug overdose. She was a drug user. That's what she was in jail for. And so now they had an interesting case from the prosecution side as to what they were going to do because they technically had no victim now for this case. So the evidence that was allowed was that the testimony from the first case was allowed to be read verbatim to these to the second jury. And the results came back this time as a conviction. The officer was found guilty and the sentencing process was he was given five years in prison. Some of the issues that we've talked about with juries is one of the biggest issues is un understanding the language, understanding the court system. Many of you uh, are just getting to the point now where you can serve on a jury and outside of television shows most of us don't understand how the system truly works. And so Unfortunately, our ignorance, which is no fault of our own, is a detriment to us when we go to sit on a jury 
and have to make decisions. And that is an issue considering we actually have to look at the fact that we are dealing with people's lives. Some people want to argue that we should actually replace the jury with a panel of judges so that the judges understand all of the legal jargon, plus they understand all the legal rules. And they are all of, if you're a judge, you have to be an attorney, so therefore you have all of that as well. The problem is, again, they're going to have biases. Another recommendation is, like I've talked about before in class, is to possibly have professional jurors. People that maybe they wanted to go to law school, decided they weren't really ready to go through and be a full attorney and try to do the state bar exam, but they were good enough students that they still understand all the legalities of everything and are able to make informed decisions and not fall for the tricks of the defense or the tricks of the prosecution. Because yes, they're going to try to run things by a jury to make them uh, vote their way. The bigger issue to all of these possible solutions to some of the other problems, especially too for those who try to get out of jury duty because it costs them money, uh, child care issues, and other things of that effect, is that if we do decide to go to those types of juries, our bigger problem is going to be that it's not necessarily a jury of the defendant's peers. And therefore, uh, the jury may not be able to be completely fair and unbiased and um, may not always have the full decision. So who knows? Maybe there's a way to mix it. Maybe we can do a panel of three judges and have the rest of the jury be out of a normal jury pool. But this way, when the legal questions come up, they can be there to answer those questions and make better informed decisions. That is something that is always questionable, interesting, and maybe for the future of you guys to turn and change. So that concludes our chapter 10 lecture. And I will be putting together chapter 11 soon. Thank you.